It's 25 to 8. And you're listening to Morning Report and something a little different this morning, the first in our series of in-depth interviews with the leaders of the major parties this election campaign. With me this morning is the National Party leader, Bill English. Tēnā koe. Good morning, Guy. Pātai tuatahi i koe, my first question to you. In nā hia koe i ako ai ki te kōrero Māori, when did you first start learning Māori? Well, I've picked it up rather than learnt it, uh, probably going back to the early 2000s uh, when I was leader of the opposition, and I thought then that it was quite important for a political party political leader in New Zealand to know some Māori. And, and, and how much <coughs> of your policy that announced that you launched your campaign with yesterday on second language learning, how much of that was about more exposure for students to te reo Māori? Well, that is an option for students now. If they, w <coughs> if they want it, they should be able to get it. Uh, it's becoming, I th it seems to be expanding in schools, and I meet some wonderful young Māori who are bicultural, bilingual, very competent, self-confident young people. Uh, so I would hope that there's going to be more of those opportunities for any New Zealander. Uh, but of course, the language uh, policy encompasses other languages as well. We're a small country at the bottom of the world, by 2021 will be the third most connected country in the world uh, with ultra-fast broadband. We want our young people to be able to compete in the world with this kind of cultural competence. Why not put te reo Māori <coughs> as a standard subject? Use the word compulsion if you like, but, but make it the, the same as any other core subject. Why not do that? Well, because trying to make people do something doesn't necessarily work. Uh, but the, we do this... make them do lots of things, don't we? Well, we do, uh, but we're not willing to take the step of making Māori compulsory. You're getting uh, uptake, you're getting uh, some real depth by people taking part when they want to. What is your position <coughs> on the Māori seats? Well, we have no plans to abolish them. Uh, we've uh, Look, the, the Māori seats uh, work effectively now. We've, of course, been in, in coalition with the Māori Party and uh, we don't see a reason to change that until or unless Māori decide that they don't need them. Because it was you, as opposition leader of the National Party in the early part <coughs> of the 2000s, who made the decision that National's policy would be to abolish the Māori seats. When did you change your mind? Well, we just haven't advanced the policy at all, and that's not our policy now. Uh, have you changed your mind on whether the Māori seats are needed? I, look, at, at the time there was a lot of debate about whether it was democratic. I, I don't no, think no, it, it is. No, no, it was you who pushed it. I remember, I was there. You pushed it. And when did you change your mind about whether well, they were needed? I can't say exactly when our positions changed. But you have changed your mind. Uh, that's right, yep. We don't, we don't plan to abolish the Māori seats. Why not? Because, look, there isn't... It, it, People just go and vote there the same as they do everywhere else. It's become an expression for Māori of the partnership that many of them feel quite strongly about. I think it would be disruptive and unnecessary. So is it political expediency or have you actually genuinely changed your mind? I've changed my mind. When you look at your government, you've been in power nine years and you've been the finance minister controlling the purse strings for a lot of that time, there hasn't been a lot of improvement in the lot of Māori in terms of those negative statistics we know so well about prisons, homelessness, uh, housing overcrowding. Uh, what inroads do you feel that you've made in those spaces? Oh, there's been a, a lot of progress. So the treaty settlement process is now well through. Uh, I think there's something like 80 settlements. So we've now got dozens of Māori groups out there who are for, looking forward. They're investing, they're starting businesses, they're creating education scholarships and so on. So that whole uh, tension that was going with the lack of settlements has essentially dwindled away, except for one or two large settlements. It hasn't made a big impact <coughs> though, has it, on those negative statistics that we talk about? It, it is going to, because that's the whole point of the treaty settlements process. This is a generational change, not next week. And when you come to the statistics, probably the, the, the uh, most positive advances there have been around education and health. So in health, for instance, it was long accepted that um, Māori immunisation rates should be 70%. Now this deals with avoidable, preventable conditions. Those rates are now over 90%, the same as everybody else's. And in education, we've gone from about half of Māori students getting... NCA level two uh, now to three quarters. That's thousands more every year. And that is going to help enable us, particularly in the context of our social investment policy, 
to have more impact on those hardcore long-term dependency statistics you refer to. I want to talk about the economy now, and I want to talk about it in, in a big picture way. We've spent lots of time on, on the minutiae of the detail. Let's talk big picture. Jim Bolger, when we interviewed him for the Ninth Floor series on former Prime Ministers, said that neoliberalism has failed. Do you agree with that? Frankly, I don't know what he meant by that. Uh, we have an economy uh, which is underpinned by market principles. That's broadly accepted. It's enabling us to be competitive in the world. We can see that with our, you know, better terms of trade, for instance. And sure, we've had but for before a long we time. get dive down that rabbit hole, are you seriously saying you don't know what neoliberalism is? Well, I don't know what Jim Bolger means. Well, uh, he means the system. He means the system of state asset sales, lower taxes. Um, government deregulation, smaller government, those things that we associate with a neoliberal economic paradigm. You were a member of that caucus since 1990 and finance minister right through to when you, uh, you took over from uh, John Key as prime minister in this current government. Surely you know what he's talking about. Look, the, way, the, 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 word, the words are a product of their time. The, this economy is in good shape. It's in one of the one of the better performing ones in the developed world by any measure. But one of the better measures is that we have a higher proportion of the working age population in work than New Zealand has ever had. Uh, I think a debate that's a left left over from the 90s is not going to guide us through the 2020s. You know what what is clear is if people if you can have lower taxes, if you can have less regulation, if you can have uh, support of social policy, you can have a successful country with a strong economy. Well, what he means by that, and what he did say to us, is it's created a situation where uh, the people right at the top are doing very well and have a lot of the wealth, and there are a lot of people living in cars and crowded into garages and struggling to make ends meet. And we're making progress on that, because uh, first, they've got much more opportunity to get a job now, than, better than ever. Uh, secondly, with the way we're adapting social policy, um, here, here's a fact. In Hamilton, homelessness has almost been eliminated by dealing with the uh, people on the street one by one and the complexity of their problems. Really? So if I go to Hamilton t today, and people may well do this after listening to you, are you saying there are no ha homeless people in Hamilton well, at all? I said almost eliminated. And in Auckland in the last four months, um, the same kind of scheme, um, Housing First, has placed 150 people in just four months. Uh, and I can see a time where homelessness is rare in New Zealand if we're smart about how we deal with it. How did you let it get so bad? By some measures, 40,000, and I know that's rough sleeping, but it's still pretty bad, isn't it? The other 40,000 people crowded into garages or surf couching on, on the, at their mate's place or living in makeshift accommodation, and then you move to about 4,000 who are literally sleeping under bridges and in hedges. How did you let it get so bad? You had nine years of it. Well, nine years in power. You, you overlook uh, the biggest homeless challenge in New Zealand, which was the Christchurch earthquakes. You know, 100,000 homes were damaged. So at a time when people weren't taking much notice, uh, this government was up to its ears in the rebuild of Christchurch because people's homes, uh, their office blocks, their apartments crashed to the ground. So our challenge there, 2010-12, was to rebuild a city whose homes had been devastated then the, uh, the Auckland house prices took off. All the work that's been done on that is now that, coming to fruition. That's interesting. So are you claiming that it was the pressure of helping rebuild Christchurch that led to these homeless issues in the rest of the country? Because you're directly linked no, to... No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, you're claiming that the government was taking no notice. I'm advising you, and you can probably find this on the record, that we had a massive task dealing with rebuilding Christchurch, which because we did have people with no homes, thousands of them in garages and lounges, no workplaces to go to. Uh, there was an enormous effort that went into rehousing tens of thousands of people there. And we've learnt, we learnt lessons from that because now Christchurch house prices are flat to falling. Uh, it's, an, it's an affordable city. It's a growing city. Uh, when the pressure came on in Auckland, we've transferred those lessons to here. And now it's working. Flat it's prices so, are, flat, house prices are flat to falling, and our ability to deal with those symptoms that you talk about is going to increase because we're going to have a more manageable market. And you said uh, about a minute and a half ago that you can foresee a time where there isn't homelessness in New Zealand. Would you be willing to commit this morning to ending homelessness in a fourth term of a national government? Oh, we're certainly going to have a very good go at it. You know, we can't guarantee that. And what I mean by homelessness is not the statistics measure of your cousin staying with your brother. It is people who are sleeping rough on the street. 
and I think that can be virtually eliminated. Interesting. So those other category that, and it's Statistics New Zealand, remember, and you know, let's be honest, it, in 2006 it was 34,000. It's now about 41,000, so it's not a new problem or necessarily no. your government's problem. But do you think that that's acceptable to be, you know, sleeping in a makeshift bedroom in a garage or couch surfing, which doesn't sound too bad if you're living in London and you're 21 and having fun, but I imagine not a lot of fun if you're an adult trying to make ends meet. I mean, I, is that acceptable? I think, uh, um, look, some of that is acceptable for 21-year-olds. I agree, you know, your sister-in-law is staying with you. Uh, but what's not acceptable is the uh, where the, is the overcrowding where people can't afford the housing costs and there's too many of them in a house and it's unhealthy for the children and not satisfactory living arrangement. Now solving that problem is a bigger, bigger, harder one and that's why we've changed the social housing system so that as we look out over the next 10 years, uh, we are renewing the approach to social housing. It'll give us a lot more flexibility uh, and a capacity to deal with what I think is still some suppressed demand, there's still more of it out there uh, than the government's familiar with. What do you mean, suppressed demand? Well, I just think there's, there's people who, we, you could go to houses and find uh, that there's families living together under the pressure of housing costs. We want to deal with that. And if I look at it and I look at um, the work that is done by MSD on income levels and how much people are actually paying. In the 1980s, the bottom quintile, right, the, the poorest of the poor, were spending 29% of their income on housing. Now it's 51%. They are spending half their pretty meagre incomes on housing. Uh, presumably they are the people who are living in those uh, sorts of conditions or being forced to. And there's two solutions to that. One is what's in our family incomes package. So the, the households in the worst situations there will on one April next year be 100 to $150 a week better off, the 20,000 who are under the most pressure with the lowest incomes and the highest rents. Uh, and the second, uh, the second solution is the longer term one, a big part of the cost, growing cost of housing has been the growth in the cost of land. And that is why we're setting out to rethink the urban planning system. And yeah. Everyone agrees we should, because in the long run, uh, that's how to get a better grip on the cost okay. of housing. Okay, Stephen Joyce said that he lifted 20,000 out of severe housing stress in that budget, right? That's the number that you gave there. He also said at that time, well, he acknowledged that 100,000 other people were, would be left in severe housing stress still. Now, what sort of policy is it when you know those people are there and you're leaving them there? Uh, it's a policy that delivers the benefits as we can, as we have the tools and the cash to do it with. So. Uh, in a budget, you get to make a range of choices. Yeah, but uh, you've got surpluses of billions of dollars. It's yes. a matter of priorities, isn't it? And there's a range of priorities. For instance, there's uh, 150,000 superannuitants who had no access to cheap doctor's visits just because they had the wrong address. We've regarded that as a priority. Uh, there's, sure, pressure, but, there's pressure from the health system because in the winter you get a lot of people going into, into hospital, uh, you want them to be able to get the treatment. So we've had the largest ever allocation related. to health. It's completely related. A lot of those people who are living in substandard housing are needlessly ending up in hospital because they're living in cold, damp homes. And I put it to you that priority one as a human being is housing pretty much. Well, where, are been... you going, where are you going to live? You've got 100,000 people in severe housing stress and your policy knows that and leaves them there. Well, I go to public meetings where priority one is health, where priority one is our aged care population, where priority one is educating our children. So look, there's a range of priorities, but I've, the point here is the solution. Well, my point before, and I know I'm interrupting, but my point here is yes, that a, a lot of those things dissolve uh, if you haven't got a, a good place to live. It's, and, it's and I'm step one. Well, it's, I'm explaining to you these solutions. So one is more cash in the pockets of those families so that they can afford it, and the market is going to become more affordable. Uh, the second solution is dealing with the systematic problem. I mean, all, one of the uh, poor planning creates real pressure for low and middle income households. And everyone now agrees in Auckland, where they planned for decades not to grow, had the effect of driving up land prices. That's what's driven up housing costs primarily. So we're fixing that. It is a generational fix. And then the third thing we're doing here is changing the social housing system because it was not flexible, not adaptable, uh, to meeting these kinds of needs. Nine years ago when you came in it wasn't. No, and now we've changed it and it's mm. taken a while. It's taken then, a while. Right, and also, for, we've now got a target for children turning up to hospital with a preventable condition. Thus, we're setting up a system based on the rheumatic fever scheme 
that someone goes to that house to sort out the direct issues that are causing the ill health. Now this is the most comprehensive approach uh, to resolving these sort of housing issues that New Zealand okay. has ever had and we want the opportunity to proceed with it because I, I'm, I agree with you, we have the capacity to solve these problems that's within reach. We've had a bit of a debate about poverty this election cycle for various reasons. Would you would you tell a white lie to wins to get a few extra dollars to clothe and feed your kids? Uh, well, I've never been fortunately never been put in that situation. Would you? Well, I would hope to think I'd hope to think I wouldn't, but I've never been put in that situation. I'm fortunate to be part of a couple of larger families. I would have uh, imag I would imagine. Well, I know from our own family that people in that situation have the support of their broader family. It'd be family. tempting though, wouldn't it? Well, of course it would be tempting. We're all human. What do you think of the way that Materia Today has been tre treated in this debate, looking back on it now? I think the way she uh, went about explaining her situation uh, probably invited some of the criticism that she got. But look, that's a matter for her. Uh, Did it nag on your mind that you'd claimed that extra accommodation allowance that it turned out you paid back? Did, was that nagging in your mind when we were having this discussion? Well, obviously it was mentioned in the public. Uh, was it nagging in your mind? Well, of course it was. I mean, and uh, I dealt with, I had to deal with those consequences. In very different circumstances though, eh? A household with hundreds of thousands of dollars of income and getting money from the taxpayer. Well, that was all. It was all within the rules at the time, as was just, as was described. I know, but do you feel because you look a little bit guilty about that now? Well, of course. Look, that was a, there was that, that was a misjudgment. I dealt with the consequences of it. Do you feel guilty about it? Well, I regret that, I regret that it ever happened. Mm. Winston Peters finds himself in a position now where public money has been paid that he wasn't entitled to, and he's paid it back. What are your thoughts about that? This is with the superannuation thing, of course. It's yeah. just breaking this morning. Look, that's a matter for Winston. It's, I mean, these are issues around his here's, personal... Here's how it, um, and I'm just keeping an eye on the time, here's how it could be an issue for you. Jacinda Ardern ruled out Materia today from a Labour Green cabinet. Would you rule out Winston Peters from a National New Zealand First cabinet on the basis of this? Well, I don't. We don't know what the facts are. I mean, Mr. all that we know is that Mr. Peters has put out a statement, um, and there's, there'll be a set of questions there which everyone seems keen to ask him, and how he deals with that uh, is up to him. Can I frame it another way? Have you seen anything yet that would rule out Winston Peters from a National New Zealand First cabinet? No, I haven't, because all we've seen is uh, Winston Peters' personal statement about it. Do you think he needs to explain more to the public? Oh, I think he will we'll have to. We all have to explain mm. ourselves in those situations. What would you advise him to do if you were in the habit of giving Winston Peters advice? Well, to do what any any person in this situation should do, whether they and we you know whether it's a matter of uh, for the public or for their own family, and that is uh, explain the facts of it. We've talked a bit about judgment and, and belief so far. I want to talk a little more about that. You voted in the past against civil unions, yeah. You voted against same-sex marriage. Uh, and the legislation for that. You voted for, in 2005, for a bill that sought to clarify that marriage should only be, be between a man and a woman. Are they, are they all correct, those three? Uh, yes. Yes. What do you think now? Did you make the right call? Well, as I said, when I became the, uh, became the prime, or leader of the National Party and the Prime Minister, uh, that I'd probably vote differently on the same-sex so, marriage. So you got it wrong? Well, I changed my mind. Why? because uh, the experience of it, I think, showed that um, it wasn't undermining of the institution of mm. marriage. You voted against prostitution reform too, was that right? Uh, yes, I stand by that. You stand by that? Yep. Would you, would you try and turn it back? Try and turn back? The reform and make it illegal again? Uh, no, I wouldn't. No. I, I ask these questions because I wonder whether, what we look for in leaders is some vision into the future about whether they're on the right side of a debate. And it seems to me that in your own admission, you weren't. Well, look, I'm openly a social conservative. And it's a definition of, of conservative in that sense, that you want to preserve things as they are. Uh, and um, so change comes along. You have different ways of dealing with it. Sometimes you have to shift with the ground. Uh, sometimes 
it's your position is your position. So that's really interesting, isn't it? Because as people go to the ballot box, that's what you stand for, keeping New Zealand as it is. Well, no, you're generalising from the social conservatism. In fact, when they go to the well, ballot so box... Well, socials, yeah, well, OK. And we could spell well, off well, into a whole no, lot of no, other stuff. Well, I'll fair pick, enough. I'll pick you up on yeah, that. Yeah, fair enough. Because a key issue in this election is social policy. There's absolutely no doubt that on social issues, National has uh, the vision for change that the Labour Party does not have. Now, that's not what people normally assume but it is absolutely the yeah, case if, this election. But your social vision was to deny people the right to marry on the basis of their sexuality. Yeah, well, it's a slightly different issue than whether... Well, uh, it's quite a big issue for them, I imagine. Well, it is for them, um, but our policy is not focused on them. The policy is focused on the toughest social problems in New Zealand, serious young offenders, and I don't know how you can equivalise these things. How to deal with 14-year-olds with multiple convictions, a household full of family violence and drug addiction. Now, we're trying to crack into that how you deal with the 370 at-risk families in Rotorua for whom the government probably only provides good services for about 150. Uh, we're trying to crack into that by changing the way our government agencies work, using data and technology. It's a completely different set of issues than a philosophical view about marriage. And so that's something sort of for the elite or something, is it? Is that what you're saying? That you're dealing with the practical stuff? And my question well, line is for the, for the elite? Well, no, they're just, different, they're just different sorts of issues. I'm, what I'm picking you up on is saying that because I'm social conservative, then somehow I have no view for the future about social issues. You know from the speeches I've given, the work that we've done, the massive changes in government, the 60,000 fewer children waking up in a welfare home this morning compared to five years ago, that we're very focused on progress on social issues. And the irony of this election is Labor have nothing to say about social progress except a few value statements. We are changing real things for actual people on the ground today. Let's look at another vision uh, and leadership and belief system, I guess, around climate change and how forward-thinking you were in that. I interviewed you in 2007 on a programme called Agenda, which both shows how long we've both been doing this. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said that climate change was a policy for, quote, the elite. Quote, I think it's largely for the political elite. You were wrong, weren't you? Well, as a day-to-day -day concern, uh, it, it's, um, I, don't, I don't think people are getting out of bed in the morning saying, look, the most important thing that happens today is that we uh, that the climate changes. I don't think that is the case, but for the for our New Zealand's well, contribution to a global effort, probably some of the Pacific Islands. Uh, for New Zealand's contribution to a global effort, we're signed up to the Paris Agreement. Uh, we've got targets there. They're actually very demanding for New Zealand, and we're committed to meeting them. Mm. Okay, I want to finish because we are uh, running out of time on some audience questions because we have uh, had um, those in prior to this. And they're, they're good, um, simple questions actually. Asha from Auckland asks, what would the top priority be uh, in the coming term of Parliament if you were re-elected? So in short order, what is your top priority? Oh, to keep the economy going in the right direction and to crack into these really challenging social problems. And Damien also from Auckland asks, what is your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? Well, look, we have big and small failures and usually if you're Give a politician, a if they're a politician, Give they're a all over one. the... <laughs> oh, well, as uh, leader of the opposition in 2002, we got a poor election result. And I learned a lot about politics from it, which has made me a much better politician. The Todd Barclay affair? You, you, you must admit you handled that poorly. Oh, look, that was just, look, that was just a... A, a dispute between two people, both of whom I happen to know. That was it. Did you handle it well? I think it will be handled about as well as I could have. Right. Just coming to the end, um, would Jacinda Ardern make a good Prime Minister? Oh, quite possibly, but that's up to the voters to determine that. I mean, she's a, she's a competent woman who's uh, doing a difficult job well. That's, a, that's a quite a generous statement. You think she would make a, a good Prime Minister? Well, it's up to the voters. The voters decide who the Prime Minister is. There's any number know, of people who could. I know, but I'm asking you. You're asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. Look, I, I think Labor would really struggle to be a government because uh, they've got a mixture of parties. They, uh, they, they, don't, have a, they don't have a team uh, that makes a lot of sense, and that's indicated by the, the policies which have basically set up a committee and get more tax out of the households. Hey, thank you so much for joining us at, at length this morning. Appreciate your time and thanks for coming into the studio. That is well, the current Prime Minister of New Zealand, the leader of the National Party, really, is uh, how we're interviewing him at the moment. And back to you in Wellington, Susie.